This is the second video in a series about mass collaboration. It covers material in chapter five of Bit by Bit. So as I said in the first video of this series, I organize mass collaborations into three broad categories. In this video, I'll be talking about human computation projects. So human computation projects are projects where there's an easy task to do, but the difficulty comes from the scale of the problem. And it's also one where humans are better at doing the task than computers. They often employ a split, apply, combine strategy where you take a big task, split it up into lots of pieces. Some work is done on those pieces and then the results are put back together. In these human computation tasks, the effort of the humans can often be magnified with supervised learning. And finally, this is an increasingly important um, type of project uh, as social, science, social researchers move from working more with numeric survey data to working with text, images, movies, and audio. And these newer forms of data are still a little bit harder for computers to analyze. And so this is an area where I think we'll see more human computation projects. So this may all seem a little abstract now, and I'm gonna give you two examples that I think help illustrate um, what kinds of things are possible with human computation projects. So the first example comes from astronomy. Um, and so simplifying a great deal, uh, astronomers are interested in um, understanding many things. One is the relationship between the shape and color of galaxies. So you can see on your screen two galaxies. The one on the left is an elliptical galaxy and the one on the right is a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. And there's a hypothesis in astronomy that um, generally spiral galaxies are blue, and, and that spiral galaxies are blue and elliptical galaxies are red. Um, and at the time, it, uh, this some astronomers were interested in this relationship, studying this relationship more carefully, particularly finding examples of galaxies that did not meet this pattern. So this required uh, hand classifying the galaxies, whether they were spiral or elliptical, because that was something that was not possible to do with a computer at the time. So uh, a graduate student named Kevin Shoansky um, worked very hard and hand classified 50,000 galaxies uh, so he, it required him to work seven 12-hour days. He classified those galaxies and they wrote this paper about, um, about using the classifications that he made. So 50,000 galaxies may sound like a lot, but it turns out that's only about a million, uh, five percent of the million galaxies that are available in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So if you want to analyze all of the galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, going with this approach is not going to work. You need something that's more scalable. And so uh, Schwansky, uh talked this over with a fellow student named Chris Lintot, and then they created this website, galaxyzoo.org, where volunteers could come see a picture of a galaxy and then classify it using the classification options here, whether it's, for example, a spiral or elliptical galaxy. So you may think, well, isn't it hard to classify galaxies? And it turns out you don't really need to be a, a graduate student in astronomy to be able to do it. So they had gave volunteers about a five minute training and then had a quiz for them. And they found that, that with five minutes of training, many people are actually able to do these classifications quite well. Uh, volunteers could classify as many or as few galaxies as they wished, and much of the recruiting of these volunteers happened through the media, media coverage of the project. So these graphs show the number of classifications over time. Uh, the, they ended up with over 40 million classifications, and they had a very um, uneven amount of, of information contributed by each person. So they had a large number of people who contributed a very few classifications, and a few people who contributed a lot of classifications. So then how do you get these 40 million volunteer classifications and turn them into a high quality set of consensus classifications that could be used for astronomical research? So the first step that they went through was a process of cleaning. So for example, only the first classification that a volunteer made of a specific galaxy was used in the analysis. 
because sometimes a volunteer who might be trying to uh, add in bogus data would, would classify the same galaxy multiple times. Um, also, anyone who classified more than two galaxies uh, more than five times had their all their classifications discarded. So whenever you open something up to these volunteers, you're gonna have to go through a cleaning process like this. Although the cleaning process varies from project to project. So part of the reason we're going through this process of how they form the consensus classifications is that although the details are specific to this study, the three steps I think occur in lots of studies. So the first step is cleaning. The second step is debiasing. Um, so uh, by having a large number of classifications and combining them, you can get rid of any idiosyncratic noise from any of the people. However, if everyone is biased to make a certain kind of classification, then that bias doesn't go away just by averaging. And so, for example, they found with a study within their um, Galaxy Zoo project that there was a bias to class away, classify far away spiral galaxies as elliptical galaxies. And so they were able to adjust for this bias. And then the third step is combine. So how do you combine uh, the 40 million classifications um, of a million galaxies, so roughly 40 classifications per galaxy, how do you combine that into a consensus? So you could, for example, take the label that was most commonly used for a specific galaxy. Um, what they ended up doing is something slightly more complicated. They had the idea that some people might be better classifiers than others. And so they tried to simultaneously estimate the label of each galaxy and estimate the accuracy of each classifier. And they tried to assign more weight to the people who are good classifiers. And so what they found is that this three-step procedure with cleaning, debiasing, and combining was able to produce a data set of comparable quality to that produced by expert coders, but at a much greater scale. And by coders here, what we mean is people who assign labels to galaxies, not computer programming coders. So this sounds amazing. They're able to use these volunteers to classify a million galaxies, but a million galaxies is actually not that much in astronomy. So they sometimes have billions or potentially even trillions of images of galaxies. They work on a truly astronomical scale. Um, so how are they going to go? So they went from working with one person to distributing it to a larger community of volunteers. How are they going to go the next step in scale? And so what they're going to do is they're going to use machine learning. So this is an image that's based, this schematic is based on a paper by Banerjee et al. And what they did is they took the um, labels of the images from Galaxy Zoo and they used those to train a machine learning model. And they tried to predict what the classification would be based on the image. Uh, then once they had that classifier, if they were able to do that successfully, then they could classify basically an unlimited amount of images. So the structure here is use volunteers to get a bunch of a high quality set of labels and then use machine learning and train the computer to imitate those volunteers. And then the computer can label essentially an unlimited number of images. So this is a great way to combine human effort and machine effort. Now, one of the exciting things that they've done is they've created this platform called Zooniverse. Um, and on Zooniverse, uh, any scientist can propose a project. And if it's accepted, it will be hosted on Zooniverse. And then they also have volunteers who are looking for projects. So they've created this great platform where volunteers and scientists can come together and um, get some great science done. So I would encourage you to check it out. And if you have a project that you think might benefit from uh, uh, um, a human computation labeling by volunteers, you should definitely consider posting it to Zooniverse. So now I wanna tell you about a second project um, that is from the social sciences and illustrates some other really exciting features about human computation projects. So this is about crowdsourced text analysis, uh, reproducible and agile production of political data by Benoit et al. So basically what this paper is about is they argue that um, in fact, often in social science, we don't use data that's directly observed. We often use data that's 
um, the data that's directly observed is then transformed by experts and then the transformed data is used by researchers. And they argue that this expert driven process is actually not very replicable and they try to argue that this is a bad thing and not a good thing. So they're going to try to argue that by doing it through a mass collaboration rather than relying on experts you actually get better properties. So they, um, they do their uh, human computation project in the area of political manifestos. So this is part of a, something called the Manifesto Project, which collected these manifestos that are produced by political parties. So here's a, uh, a piece of the manifesto from the Labour Party of the United Kingdom in 2010. So it says, millions of people working in our public services embody the best values of Britain helping empower people to make the most of their lives while protecting them from the risks they should not have to bear on their own. Just as we need to be bolder about the role of government in making markets work fairly, we also need to be bold reformers of government. So this is an example of a piece of text that is in a manifesto, and these kinds of texts are being produced by political parties in many countries in many years. And so you can imagine that political scientists would want to study these manifestos. So they would be interested in, for example, how people talk, how does the way that governments talk, how does the way that political parties talk about governments change over time? How does that differ in systems that use a parliamentary form of voting versus other forms of voting and so on? Um, so this had been coded previously by experts and what Benoit and colleagues did is they tried to also code it using a human computation project, a mass collaboration. So they split up each big document into sentences and then they uh, sent it to uh, someone to try to code whether it was about economic policy, social policy, or neither economic or social policy. And then they had to label if it was about economic policy, was it very left, somewhat left, neither left nor right, somewhat right, very right. And likewise for social policy, they had to label it very liberal, somewhat liberal, neither liberal nor conservative, somewhat conservative or very conservative. So that's an example. So in the Galaxy Zoo project, there was a million images. This got split up into groups and people had to label whether it was spiral or elliptical. Here we have a, a um, political manifesto that's split up into sentences and now people have to label it whether it's economic or social policy and what um, kind of leaning does it have. So what this graph shows is once they distributed this to, um, in their case they did not use volunteers, they used paid workers through a platform similar to Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, they found that expert coding of estimates was very close to crowd coding of estimates. So this gives them a lot of confidence that uh, their procedure can produce reliable data. And now you may say, well, again, this feels like we've just recreated something that was already able to do elsewhere. And what I like about their paper is they go beyond showing that they can just reproduce the experts. They also show that they can do things that are better than what the experts can do. So for example, when, but because their process is more flexible, so for example, when the manifesto project started, they were not actually coding um, immigration statements in the original manifestos because that was not a, an important topic when the project started, the manifesto project. Um, so Benoit et al. then are able to use their crowd-based system to go back and recode all of the project, all of the manifestos for issues related to immigration. So they argue that because their process is dependent on a crowd and not on experts, it's more flexible. And they also argue that their project is much more reproducible. So they ran their, their crowd coding on the manifestos, then two months later they ran it again and got basically the same results. So showing that the measurement process can be repeated in this way is a big advantage. So in this sense, they argue that what they're doing is not just cheaper, it's better. It's better because it's more flexible and it's better because it's reproducible. And so what I like is the way that this project turns experts into a bug and not a feature. That is, 
a lot of times as social researchers, we're very invested in having experts do things. And for some things, experts are really ideal. But experts bring problems as well. And so sometimes we should realize that experts can be bugs and not just features. Okay, so with these two examples in mind, I wanna go back to the points that I started with about mass collaboration. So these are easy task, big scale problems where humans are better than computers. So if you think about the task in Galaxy Zoo and you think about the task in Benoit et al's uh, research about manifestos, that was a relatively easy thing to do. Almost anyone could do it without specialized training uh, in, in a very limited amount of time. Um, and those, but the difficulty came not from the task, but from the scale of the task, the number of things that needed to be labeled. And in these two examples, these were things that uh, people were better at doing than computers. The split apply combined strategy was used. So in both cases, a huge number of items was split up. Some work was applied to each piece and then the results were combined. I didn't talk about very much how the Benoit et al did the combined step, but it had many of the same features that appeared in the uh, Galaxy Zoo combined step. So debiasing, uh, cleaning, debiasing, and then combining with a statistical model. Uh, human effort can be magnified with supervised learning. I think this is one of the really exciting things about the Galaxy Zoo project is you can see how with enough um, volunteers, you're able to create a supervised learning system that's potentially infinitely scalable to, to all of the data that you might possibly ever collect. And again, these are examples, the two examples here involved images and text. And I think increasingly as we work with these newer forms of data in social science research, um, having these human computation projects will be increasingly important. So if you'd like to know more, uh, I recommend there's a book called Human Computation um, by La and Van An. Van An is um, uh, one of the first people associated with the idea of human computation, although the way he uses the term is slightly different than the way I've used it here. Uh, there's also a really great paper re about a project called ReCAPTCHA by Van An. And then the last thing that you could read next is uh, this um, article about Amazon Mechanical Turk. And the reason why I think that's relevant here is that many of these human computation projects involve sending jobs to workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk. And so that platform is uh, generally pretty important in this area of mass collaboration. So that was the second video uh, in a series about mass collaboration. And in the next video, I'll talk about a different form of mass collaboration, open calls. So in human computation, the difficulty comes from the scale of the problem. Uh, and in open calls, this involves a mass collaboration where the researcher might not even know how to solve the problem herself, but yet through a mass collaboration, we can come up with some novel solutions. Thank you.